Stanford University. Welcome. Uh, Double E 380, spring quarter is heading along nicely. In the past, I've made fun of MIT people for wintering out here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't mentioned the CMU folks <laughs> who have moved out here, and they even have a sign on 101. So you're driving north, and there's CMU, and when did you get to Pittsburgh? Um, I mention that because today's speaker, Jim Morris, is from CMU, and he lives out here, which I think shows very good taste. Um, today's talk is in honor of Earth Day. Uh, my first remembrance of Earth Day is underage drinking at UC Davis. I hope you have more. Well, I spilled some. <laughs> uh, the question was, what did it have to do with Earth? Uh, well, not much. Um, how many of you, either here in reality or in TV land, drove alone today? Uh, well, okay. How many of you didn't drive at all, so you just walked from a dorm? Okay, well, so it's split evenly between people who live on campus and people who drove alone. Well, you live close enough to, to walk or whatever. So we have at most one person who didn't do the evil. Today's talk discusses alternatives, and as is often the case, many of the problems are social. So, Jim Morris. Thank you. Can, can I stand in front? Will yeah, you can, uh, you can walk up the sides, okay. in fact. Okay, and the TV, TV will the follow? TV will follow you. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just sit here. So there's, uh, as, as the title indicates, there are more questions I'm going to ask questions, and I hope you'll feel free to answer them whenever the answers occur to you. Uh, I've been kind of fascinated by this topic for about a year, and this talk is sort of part of, the, part of what I've learned, but really more about what questions I have. Uh, so technologically, or if we're sitting around with entrepreneurs or social planners, what you would say is, Gosh, it is so hard to get from one place to another in the Bay Area and many other places without a car. Uh, we need something that just solves my problems, or what the consumer or the traveler wants is something that solves my transportation problem. A little bit the way Google Transit attempts to do for purely public transportation. Uh, so the only, as I'll mention in a minute, the only thing it actually doesn't do is include all the things that would patch it together. If you go on Google Transit, and ask how to get from here to there, it like takes maybe three hours instead of 40 minutes. So it's, it just shows you that our transit system is in not such good shape. So the idea is, uh, for various reasons, we might want to be able to get along without a car. How could we, how could we improve the situation? Uh, in other places and times, uh, ride sharing has worked just fine. Uh, there's sort of a funny picture from India here. Uh, and uh, Let's see, and in Cuba, it's very popular. If you're a government employee in Cuba, it's against, you have to pick up all hitchhikers by law. Uh, very popular or in Israel. Jail, hmm? I put them in jail. Uh, <laughs> may, no, 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 no. It's perfectly legal to hitchhike in Cuba. Sorry. No, no, no. You're supposed to give them a ride. In this country, maybe in 1943, lots of people were doing it. They were certainly being exhorted to do it. Uh, and currently, as many of you might know, in Was Washington, D.C. and San Francisco, there are phenomena called casual carpooling in one place and slug lines in the other that have lots of people just jumping in the cars with people to avoid so that the drivers can be in the HOV lanes. Uh, there are even, in the case of slug lines, there are even t-shirts you can get that say, I'm a, a slugger. Uh, so it does happen. Uh, Question, since this is Silicon Valley, most of the people I talk to are asking me the question, is this a good business? Could we, could we start a business to do this? Otherwise, don't bother me. So I've done an extent, a lot of the reading and stuff I've done is about the past and the present, about how many people are doing, running, trying to start a business which provides ride sharing or support for the traveler in various ways. Uh, in the 90s, there were a lot of such companies, and they seem to have been kind of wiped out by 
natural forces, just failures of business, but maybe the withdrawal of government support. So right now, as you might expect, they're actually not just the ones I have up here listed as alive, but there are probably over 100 in the world, uh, maybe 100 in the United States. All kinds of little businesses are starting to help you uh, get around, hitchhike, carpool, uh, find public transportation, whatever. On the other hand, when you look at the companies that tried and failed, there are lots of people, including the guy who's called the father of casual carpooling, who says, I've given up on this. It can't work as a business. I just got back, by the way, from a, a, a meeting at MIT of car sharing enthusiasts. And there are a couple of companies. Vigo was there, uh, New Ride, uh, Goose, and iCarpool. And they at least came to the meeting and were willing to talk about what they were doing. There was somebody from Go Loco, and some of them were claimed to be a cash flow positive. Are but trying to make money, actually? Yeah. 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 New Ride claims that they're, uh, they're in four or five different cities and are making uh, the total of a million dollars a year cash flow. So it's, but it's not something, if, if I talk to my venture capital friends, they just say, forget it. Um, OK, so why might it work now? Like many of you, being an engineer, I just looked around and said, well, look at all this great new technology. And we were interested in mobile applications. And that's actually how this idea started for me. We've got GPS and smartphones. We've got Google Transit, which certainly is showing the way to a, a lot of good things. Uh, we've got Facebook, uh, which can be leveraged into supporting the, these kinds of things. We have the technology and the idea behind eHarmony, namely matching up people or similar interests with various purposes. And we have seen, we've, and we've seen eBay and other auction kind of things that may come in handy. So we, there's a lot of new stuff since the 90s which we could try to apply to this problem. And furthermore, there's like a new attitude which we can all sort of feel in the land right now. Partly, people are telling us that the, the world has changed. And so whatever you think was true before might not be true anymore. So there's a new normal which may involve having fewer cars or less money and various other things, fewer houses, more people renting houses, living in urban centers. Uh, there's also just this general mood that in the age of Obama, we could do things that were unthinkable before. Uh, and finally, and this, I think this is interesting, the, the generation of people called the millennial generation, people from about 5 to 25, are advertised as having a distinctly more positive pro-social attitude than those other bad generations that went before, like Generation X. So you guys in the millennial generation? All right, too old. Here's your generation. You know, those evil Generation X people. Right. Uh, but it, we used to be different, too. Yeah, right, right. Anyway, the, but, but for marketing purposes, it's probably important to keep that in mind. Uh, usually what people say is, especially engineers, <laughs> is, People, don't, people can't change. All discussions I have with engineers, or for that matter, venture capitalists say, <laughs> don't start a business that depend upon people changing. So but I claim that people can change. Maybe they, maybe they can. <laughs> uh, so now, as one of my gurus once told me, yeah, people change. They usually change for the worse. Uh, but nevertheless, we could, something could happen here. So now. Let me, this is basically a little made up theory that's up for grabs about how this might work. And because I wrote a, uh, an NSF proposal for this, like everybody else who heard about the stimulus money, uh, I had to dress it up and say, this isn't just about ride sharing. This is about a new concept called social physical systems, where you have to solve a bunch of physical problems, like where is everybody, and where's the medical equipment, or where's the news story. Uh, where are my local campaign managers? Who, and who, but you also have to solve a bunch of social problems like, does this person do business with this other person? And what's the value chain look like? So we've got these complicated systems. We look at it from the other side. We have things like Facebook and MySpace and everything, which are like purely social systems that tend to exist entirely on the internet, but don't inter interact with the real physical world. Uh, anyway. So a model, which I'm usually going to use for the ride sharing thing, but you could think of applies equally well to all of it, is a certain way that this looks, the way a, the system would look to the participant in the system. In the beginning, you're just a person, and then somehow motivation or marketing convinces you to be a subscriber in this ride service or ride sharing system or Facebook or whatever. 
Uh, then once you're subscribed, how often do you try to use it? That's based on some other elusive variable called enthusiasm, like I, this is doing something good for me. So you propose doing something, such as offering or giving a ride to somebody, or just looking for a ride. Uh, then the system, through a lot of computer crunching, figures out what's a feasible solution to your travel problem. Uh, and then you sort of, the way I'm envisioning this system, you sort of then go into person-to-person -person negotiations, maybe represented by computers, with the actual people that are feasible partners for you. And they decide whether you're compatible based upon cost and relationships. And then maybe finally you reach success in your partners for this endeavor, this ride. And then the partnership contributes, if you have a successful partnership, it contributes to your enthusiasm. So it's a pretty simple pipeline. It's only useful really, first of all, for like organizing this talk. Maybe it's... Question? Okay. Yeah. But if we apply this to the eHarmony problem, you usually don't go back up on the list. Oh, but there are other sites for that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, but, oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. If you finally get married, uh, which is the eHarmony deal, you're supposed to drop out. And indeed, now that you mention it, that's a big problem for carpool sites. They set people up in their carpools and they drop out and they lose track of them. But that's a good point. This is felt. Good point. There's a. In fact, uh, I should modify the model to have have that happen because it is a real problem. Good. Good point. Um, so, uh, I don't expect you to read all of this, but just to say that I'm not talking about the one little the part up there called motivation. I'm just going to go through it in the order of the model. How do you motivate people? Well, that's sort of called marketing and other things. And most people I know, most of my engineer friends, usually are, base their opinions about people on a sample size of one, and they tell you how they believe Everybody is based upon how they feel about car sharing or giving people rides or whatever. That's probably true, but we should guard against that. We should think that there are lots of different kinds of people. And I actually learned at one point about this sort of commercial system that SRI sells called VALS that says, claims that there are three kinds of people. There are people who are driven by ideals, people who are driven by achievement, and people who are driven by self-expression although certainly we all must be a linear combination of these people. And when you're crafting your marketing message or whatever, uh, you should keep in mind that there are those different demographics. Or, well, actually, these are not demographics. These are attitude things. Then the second thing about these groups is we add in demographic information, such as age and, and uh, resources, namely wealth. And the SRI people actually computed a lot of percentages, so they know how... We know that 13% of the people, for example, are experiencers, according to their survey, and their average or median age is 25. So it just say when, when you're, when you're going to market something, maybe you should choose a subset of these people to try to draw into your web. And my guess at the right thing to do is to go after the strivers and experiencers who happen to be young, uh, maybe in the millennial group, and these other people called the innovators who apparently will try anything. So, so, uh, so much for the way to segment the market or what to look at. Uh, a, lot more, a lot more experience is needed before one can figure out where this market really is. So Jim, it seems a little odd that you didn't go after either of the ideals subgroups. Uh, yeah, right. The ideals? Those yes, the ideals people might do it for greenness. And in fact, if you'll see over here on the right, I had some why would a person join or not join? And the thinkers want solitude. The believers maybe want independence. On the other hand, they might share for, in order to be green. And yes, it's certainly a lot of people will do this because it's green. Although in an earlier look at the world I did, I came to the conclusion that only goes so far. And lots of people I talk to, like the venture capitalists, say, you have to base your business plan on the seven deadly sins. Find real drivers, and these people who are strivers do it for status and greenness, and the experiencers uh, like to meet people, maybe, and so forth. So it's anybody's guess. But I, frankly, I, yeah? Um, last year's computer forum, the industrial, the industrial forum, the topic was social networks. And everybody's wondering where social networks are going to go. So for your own reference, you might talk to Suzanne Vegas upstairs 
about. I think they're older people. What I hear is it's like older. No, but it's, it's a real it's a real mix of the various people. About yeah. half of this for social network sites came out of Stanford alone. As yeah, example. not nearly as successful as other. I know that uh, there was a startling median age for the people who play World of Warcraft. It's like forty. Um, uh, that's that's a good point. Stanford made the sign up. My wife had to sign up. Sorry. Um, uh, the median age there seems a little high. Did, did that somehow eliminate everybody under 10 to move the median age to so high? Oh. Because the United States median age is roughly 30, I think, or less. And there's only two groups under 30 there. I'll have to check that. I think these were all people who filled out surveys. So I think maybe it started at 15 or 20. So that's a good point. The, this is, SRI is, sells this thing to... Um, Okay. Uh, people who are trying to market stuff, so the person has to be able to spend money. So I would suspect it starts at You've 14. You've got children then. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah, four year, maybe 14. But that, I, I'm sure that they, the report's pretty good. You have to have to pay 100 bucks for it or something. But I think that it's uh, probably specifies that. But that's a good point. Um, anyway, uh, on on to progressing through this model. For me, this is one of the more interesting questions. All these businesses that failed and succeeded, and the special ones that failed said, we never got to critical mass. And so people describe critical mass as enough people. But what critical mass really is, you physicists in the audience will know, is that's the point at which it becomes self-sustaining. That's when the system is working so well that you don't have to market it anymore. So when presumably the moment when you passed a critical mass would be called a tipping point, obviously. Uh, so because there's a a feedback loop here, maybe positive or negative, but because there's a hopefully positive feedback loop, there's a real chance for a critical mass. And the way it works is the more enthusiastic you are, the more you propose, and then the more, more people propose, the more chances there is of a match, uh, obviously. So that sort of is an amplifier. And then the more people who are feasibly partners, then they may match with each other, and then they successfully partner and creates more enthusiasm. So I built a really trivial simulation model of this and said, so this, this, these numbers are all purely fictitious, just chose these, num these numbers are, suppose your ride sharing system runs for 25 days, everybody starts off with a 20% probability of asking or offering a ride, and then they succeed or don't succeed, and then they change their, pro their enthusiasm, namely their probability of proposing up or down based upon that, uh, how many people do you have to have as subscribers before it's a critical mass? And the answer from this trivial civil simulation is about 400. Uh, but one of the things that needs to be done is to go and compare this with real experience. The Zimride people say you have to have about 1,000 on a campus before they feel it takes off. But knowing this tipping point is, knowing that there is a tipping point and knowing how to predict when you get to it would be very important for businesses. And I've searched cursorily the economics literature and it doesn't seem to address this problem very much in the sense that they're they're interested in equilibria but how something starts and builds doesn't seem to be something you find in economics certainly in market types of travel so for example local commuting traffic versus going up into san francisco versus event based where there's there's a spontaneous group going to and from the airport things like that not certainly not in, not in the context of this model. Certainly, this was just a really trivial simulation. But lots, it's getting segmented right now by all the entrepreneurs who try it. For example, Zimride is sort of a university-based thing. Uh, New Ride is a within business sort of thing, as are many. Doing it within a business is a good idea, and Zimride and others have done the other thing you suggested, which is event-based link-ups, which uh, might be. Sounds like a good idea to me, and Zimride thought it was, but I don't know how well it works out because there's a very concentrated time. Turns out people who are carpooling, people will resist carpooling just because they're in a bad mood about going to or coming from work. Whereas if you're going to a baseball game or something or an event, you might be in a social mood. So I think it's really worth trying, frankly, uh, as a marketing strategy. Uh, anyway, this. Uh, this tipping point, it would, be, it would be nice to know that there is one and, and how you could reach it. That would tell you whether you should give up with your marketing campaign or not. It's sort of seat of the pants information that these companies are accumulating right now. 
Uh, and here, now here's one, the whole theme of these next two slides or three is the cell phone may have changed the game. Uh, so the, the number of feasible rides could be increased in a certain way. And here's my trivial example, simple example. S consider San Francisco and Silicon Valley. You have, uh, let's see, 10 neighborhoods and 20 companies. Uh, and, uh, and the people are sort of uniformly distributed around these neighborhoods and companies. So if you do the divisions assuming uniform distributions, there are about five people in your neighborhood who are dr also driving to your company. So uh, then we say, okay, so those are two people who match, who are feasible matches because they go into the same place at about the same time. What are the chances of them actually being compatible in the other inscrutable ways people are compatible? Suppose the chances of that is one in 10. Uh, then if you just multiply out the probability that the person gets a ride, it's about 40%. Uh, be, uh, so you, uh, you have a chance, your, your chances of getting a ride on any given day is about 40% uh, in a carpool. But all you have to do is say you can change your car once. Uh, so if you, now the numbers are very different because the, starting off with these 1,000 commuters, they're, they're distributed across the neighborhoods. 100 apiece are driving down 101. Uh, so you can get a ride with one of those 100 and then Somewhere on 101, there are 50 people going to your company because there are 20 companies. We divided 1,000 people by 20. So now, the, and once again, assuming there's only a 10% you're compatible, now the probability of getting a ride is one. It just skyrockets because of uh, the, the formula. I mean, it's just because you can change. And also, your intu intuition about this is quite simple. A hub is a good idea. Everybody knows that hubs are good. It's the way the airlines concentrate their business. And so you could do something at the airport or Millbrae. The Millbrae BART stop maybe already is a hub for this kind of thing. But the interesting point is that you don't actually need to establish a real physical hub. You could just do it by selecting one good place to transfer. And furthermore, even after you've made disagreement with your potential partner, whoever it is, you could keep in constant contact. So the one thing we all know about cell phones is now people don't have to make detailed plans and rendezvous is much easier. So if you could make this rendezvous, now when you first suggest to people that they're going to get off the highway somewhere on 101 and wait for somebody else that they might, may or may not know to pick them up, it doesn't sound too plausible. But that's part of the problem to be solved here and you have to use the cell phones and the GPS and all of that to what do it. Adding I was saying in the DC model, just have to have a test station if you have a driver with you, if, if you have a passenger with you. So if the government would some local government would check on the freeway right there, yes, to make sure that you have the high incentive structure to fill up around there. Oh yes, I mean, right above they, and below have your exchange place. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah, okay, that's a good, that's a good point. And, and and maybe other ways and, and the big traffic jam probably is along 101. I mean, all of you, all of us drive down 101. We see all those other people driving by themselves, and you say, something's wrong. That's what many people, they say, something's wrong here. Or we, got, we, can, we can make money out of this. This is, this is the best deal since getting free energy out of seawater. You know, we know how well that one has worked. So, but anyway, uh, yes, certainly some Maybe government. Just a camera that uh, claims it's check. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gotten two tickets for driving in the HOV lane. Uh, don't do it with your top down. That was the first thing I learned. <laughs> anyway, so this whole thing with the cell phones and everything, well, in, th in principle, could change the game. It requires a lot of work to have it be, to figure out safe places for people to transfer to, uh, uh, to figure out what happens when something goes wrong, a lot of these ride sharing systems have found they have to provide absolutely positively guaranteed backup. You sort of want to steal the Federal Express motto so that people talk about what the ride sharing system sometimes will contract with taxi cab companies to pick up somebody whose ride has failed. Or Google at one point was giving people cars to drive home for the night if uh, they, or around the area if they wanted it. Uh, so anyway, this agility makes it better. Uh, now, if there are any algorithms fans in the office this, or in the, in the room, this is just a, this is a, once again about how to do feasible rides. First of all, in the process of this, I discovered there's something called moving object databases, which are 
pretty cool. It's about been a 10-year research project by a small segment of the database corporation where you or database community where you put you just add the time. I guess you add time windows and maybe place windows to your queries, and it sort of answers with respect. Respect to time. So the typical DOD application was how many helicopters of what kind will be in this area two minutes from now or five minutes from now. But there are also these things for networks. So that would be one way to try to do the matching problem. Uh, I'm actually, before I discovered those, I was thinking of an algorithmic way to do it. And my way was you just take all the drivers and their chosen routes that they're planning, and this could include Caltrain and buses and everything, and you, and you construct a giant graph, uh, including all the times, of when these people are going. So driver three starts off, and maybe he goes down 101 and then tails off to the right, and driver one comes in. And so we've got three drivers here who coincide for a while and one train. Uh, so, uh, and so it turns out that so that's, that's your starting graph. And then when a rider enters the picture, uh, you just use your favorite algorithms for finding inexpensive paths through the, uh, through the graph, which will more or less automatically generate the right kind of switches. So in this particular one, the person starts off in the, in the neighborhood of driver three, but then when driver three tails off, he changes over to the yellow, uh, yellow driver. Um, so that will that would sort of fall out of the algorithm, and if you get all the costs right, you have to do things like charge a cost for the time of the rider. Otherwise, it will turn out that the the cheapest way to get there is to walk. Uh, the fastest way to get there is to take a taxi all the way. You have to these cost these cost numbers have to be carefully worked out. I suppose one hypothesis is there is a single cost you can put into this algorithm. So that's. Uh, everybody tells me that this is not the problem to be solved. There are lots of algorithms that will do the matching, especially when you don't have too many people. But maybe if you, if you become successful, you'll have to have good, al good fast algorithms. Uh, now we're down here. Let's talk about the compatibility issue. I had these two bubbles here were feasibility, which is sort of like phys physical matching. Can we get from here to there using these drivers? Compatibility is where the people decide whether they really want to ride together or whether you really want to take the train or, or whatever. So looked at in a simple way, we say, well, suppose we can't figure out compatibility at all, so we just put a probability on it as I did before. Uh, then uh, how does the likelihood of getting a match increase with the number of feasible partners? And assuming n is like the average of the Poisson distribution, the answer turns out, not surprisingly, to be a, a nice exponential. And in particular, it sort of suggests that, once again, that there's a tipping point. I used this idea in that tipping point calculation because once you get in this thing, once again with purely made up numbers, you know, once you get up to 30, 30 people, then it almost doesn't matter how what your probability is. You're, if you just get up to a probability of 0.1, you're up in the 80%, 90% range of, of finding a ride. I mean, that big sort of grayish area there is, is, is all a probability of one. So that, once again, is intuitively very simple. Uh, it's a, one of the, suppose P is the attractiveness of a person, and N is the number of people they ask them to marry them. Uh, the simple answer is, if you can't improve your attractiveness, if you ask enough people, eventually you'll find the right person. Or if you kiss enough frogs, you'll find your prince or whatever. So this is a surprising easier. If you just get more people, and the point is, as you increase the people, it kind of goes up exponentially. So once again, it smells like a tipping point to me. But as with eHarmony, some people match better than others. Oh, sure, sure. The, uh, that's right. The problem, yeah, I'm just, yeah. I'm just reasoning is sort of suppose there's some uniform probability across the whole population. But... Uh, Doing good matching has not been explored extensively by the ride matching services. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about these things that influence the compatibility. And they're relatively obvious. There's the convenience thing. And people who have actually done experiments say, or done run businesses, or done surveys, or whatever, say that if you can keep the time penalty down to 20 or 30 percent, people will do it. If you can make it convenient by allowing people to do the scheduling 
as late as possible, it's good. If you can make it completely reliable somehow by throwing out people who, who are undependable or backing up with cabs, that's good. And you have to treat lost time as a cost so you don't waste people's time with stupid, stupid routes. Uh, then that's the convenience part. The economic is if a person doesn't own a car, they're with you all the way. So that's, that's not so bad. Uh, you can award coupons or points that lead to free gifts from retailers. That's something New Ride does. Uh, then the thing you mentioned, you can increase all the different things you do on the highways to actually um, encourage people and make the HOV lanes. The HOV lanes are supposed to do that for us already, and indeed they, they do a little bit. And finally, there's issues about uh, companies can subsidize people for riding their bikes or uh, taking public transit. There's no way to subsidize ride sharing right now because there's no way to account for it. That's one of the things uh, this group in, MI, uh, in Boston was talking about last week, about changing. Also, our cognitive costs, uh, how easy is it to use the system? If the system is too hard to use, uh, even if it does all the rest of it, as well, people are likely to say, I'm just going to take my car. Yes. And I, frankly, I've come to the conclusion that people who live in New York City suffer, a, even though it's supposed to be great for mass transit, I think one of the hassles of living in New York City is that constant cognitive load of deciding how to get from one place to another. I mean, everybody says it's convenient, but I, on the other hand, living in California, don't actually expend any thought at all until I'm sitting at my desk. Because uh, sort of, you can just sleepwalk through your day, you find yourself in your car. So I agree. And the system has to be super convenient. And there are some who say, forget all this cell phone and computer stuff. Just do the casual carpooling thing where you go to a place and somebody drives up and you get in their car. Uh, there's a, an argument can be made. There's going to be lots of customers of this who don't want to mess with micro commitments or micro contracts. They just want to go to a place and jump in the car. Uh, and that's where, that's, that works very well, by the way, in San Francisco. Well, transportation systems, which is what SkyTran is all about. And that's, <clears throat> if you make the assumption that you'd be willing to walk at least five minutes, or if you take do something like take a bike. I, I stop attending conferences by driving downtown San Francisco. I take the Caltrain. But I get on the Caltrain with a bike. Yes. It gives me leverage that walking doesn't have. And I actually get to much further parts of San Francisco. Well, the disadvantage of that is I don't know the bus or um, the other light rail system that, that, that San Francisco has. So, you know, it, it, just, it just depends on... You, you, well, you need... I mean, I'm, uh, I am constantly talking with my friends at Google saying, Google Transit is a great start, but I want the complete solution that says, drive your car to the Caltrain station with your bike on the back of your car, get on, get on Caltrain with your bike. If you have an inflatable bike. Yeah, right, right, the, the, or a uh, whatever kind of bike. In fact, one of the people who came to one of our conferences came all the way from Berkeley using, using just that method. Uh, so you want the solution that you and I can figure, and a new, let's say a New Yorker is capable of incredible cunning in figuring out their travel paths. Some of them. I see my wife pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, right. right. That's enough. Well, sorry. Well, anyway, anyways, but hey, yeah, so but for, for those of us who don't like to figure it out, you could have a computer program or Google Transit beefed up that would do it all. Uh, as well as, and uh, never mind, I'm getting, getting. So now then there's this other much more complicated or let's say more mysterious thing called the relationship is what, who do you want to get into a car with independent of the cost? And this is a, once again, a, a 10 minute theory. Part of it is familiarity. If you ask the average person, they say, yes, if the person works for my company, I'll probably give them a ride. Big company, small company, whatever it is. I don't have to know the person, but I know I can figure out who their boss is or I can check up on them. So I give that a chance. So familiarity is good. Uh, and so I said, you know, it's like, do you know the person directly or can one of the nodes in this little chain of um, connections be the organization? So I say that sort of tails off quickly, but is, is important. And then this is an idea pressed on me by Ted Selker, who said, especially in Silicon Valley, where everybody is such a high achiever, you can convince people that they are, that that time spent in their car by themselves is less efficient time. There might be people who are decompressing or 
listening to NPR or something. But in fact, you could be getting much more out of that 40 minutes or an hour a day you spend commuting. And we should get people together to do that. So if you want to learn French, we can hook you up with a native French speaker who you give a ride. If you want to uh, you know, start a business where you can interview your future business partners this way. And in fact, if you just want to get a date, there's a, a dating site called It's Just Lunch, I think, that says, this is not, you're not getting married, you're just having lunch with the person. So you could have a, a ride, sh ride sharing site called It's Just a Ride. Uh, so there are lots. You get in the car before you know them, as opposed to getting in the car after you know them. That's right. So, well, that's, that's kind of a leap. Okay. The theory is you would, you know, somebody from your business that you sort of knew. So there was some familiarity and some common purpose um, and so forth. Uh, there could be lots of ways these relationships could be worked out. And that's part of, and let's say in the ride sharing thing is kind of simple, but if we went back to some of those other systems like uh, a medical system, then there would be, well, are you in the network or out of the network? Are you willing to work with this doctor from who has this patient and all the whatever negotiations that goes on between medical caregivers and everything has to be carried out in this relationship uh, familiarity thing. Sometimes you could win really big. When I was a consultant taking Caltrain up in San Francisco, I discovered there were a lot of things I could do on the train that were actually billable hours. Yes. Well, certainly, well, the, the reason Google may or may not be interested in this is they have this sort of very expensive solution right now involving people on Wi-Fi, and they, uh, each Googler probably puts in an hour on those Gary Bauer buses. Yeah, well, yeah, the commuting, strangely, commuting on trains makes people feel happier about doing that than on buses, but I think the Gary Bauer buses are pretty good. There's one advantage of Caltrain. You can drink and eat. Ah, uh, you probably can't. No, they, they just allow drinking eating on Bauer buses, too. Well, but, but that's... The, the Bauer buses for Google is the fact that they can develop stuff in secret. Yeah. That's you, right. don't have to, you, know, you don't have people looking over their shoulders. On I talked to the, the, the guy who runs that system. His biggest problem that week was people were making out on the Google bus and other people were taking pictures of them and, and using the Wi-Fi to upload it so when they got to their office, their office mates would tease them. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do anything on the Google oh. bus. Yeah. I think this question is appropriate for this slide. It's today, you know, today's headlining news that there's a Google, or there's a Craigslist killer. Yes. Right. And it kind of brings up the idea of an unregulated network. You know, perhaps on eHarmony it's not going to happen because we know who the people are on eHarmony. Part of this whole thing is, yeah, you want to build, the network may or may not have anything to do with ride sharing. So for example, you might want to have a, a ride sharing add-on to your friends' Facebook groups so that you already have a connection with people. You may even want to have completely independent sites. I, for example, there is eHarmony and Match.com, which are global dating sites, but then there are special sites for people from, from particular religions or particular countries. And instead of going to eHarmony and checking off the thing that you're uh, Persian, you actually go to the special Persian site because you feel that that was made especially for you. I think there are lots of, you might want to go first with the, um, uh, the relationship things. Yeah, like, you mean like J-Date. J-Jewish. Yeah. Right. So I don't, you know, you, so I don't know what the psychology of people doing this is, but, but certainly Craig, Craigslist, by the way, offers this service, offers ride sharing along with everything else, and, but it's not very effective because they're not really doing any more than being a poster. Yeah. Thinking about <coughs> the uh, hitchhiking problem, looking at the uh, Moffitt, uh, field pickup area on 101 and thinking, you know, who would dare get in a car with a stranger? And thinking, you know, you could really solve a lot of that problem just by taking a photograph of the driver and the rider and their driver's licenses or ID information uh, as they depart. But you'd have to have centralized locations then where that gets kept. Oh, sure. Well, no, but with the cell phones, look. I mean, in fact, I, there was a guy uh, from Nokia at this meeting I went to was talking about, oh, you touch the cell phones and their RFID things go off, and that turns out, he was arguing from an HCI point of view, that was much better because it replaced 10 clicks by one click, just the click of the two phones together. So you would click your phones together, and you've already registered for this service. You already have a rating. When you get out of the car, you give the person a rating. So 
rationally anyway, I think that safety security problem can com be completely solved. And on the irrational side, we got these, these people up in, in the East Bay who are jumping in cars all the time without any questions asked. So it is threatening, or there are, there are issues about this, and it always makes the news. But uh, actually, we're planning to do, we, we actually want to do a lot of surveys, or let's say, not surveys, but very, let's say, some combination of in-depth interviews tracking people's behavior. Because I actually, we all think of the safety thing, but it, in practice, it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem. I think the real problem is, as you suggested, just the hassle of doing it all. Plus, I don't know, but there are other reasons. You, uh, a carpool represents a kind of permanent relationship. This ad hoc ride, ride sharing might be more congenial to people because you just do it once. So, so there are lots of, let's say, what we call marketing tricks that can be tried, might make this work. So finally, uh, that my conclusion <laughs> is this, this problem is hard. Uh, the, because of all the convenience and reliability of a car. If we didn't have the personal automobile, we'd have to invent it. It's really a great thing. Uh, we, there's actually a survey. You must have been laughing at my second bullet. The sociologists do all these surveys all the time, hoping to find out that people want to do this. And they often discover that, no, people, actually, they've accommodated themselves to their drive. If it's too long a drive, they'll move their house. If they listen to Terry Gross or whoever, or whatever, or books on tape, or so it's not as if we're solving a horrible pain for people. Uh, and so how to, and as I say, the, the, one of the reasons it's hard is how do you get something started so that you could demonstrate some traction. Uh, on the other hand, it's a problem that has always been worth solving, not just there's climate change, and there's a lot of money being spent just in the marginal, marginal cost of driving those cars by yourself. It was estimated by me from census data at $131 billion, and somebody, somebody at the workshop I just went to said it was like twice that. So there's, a lot, so there's money sloshing around in that that could be saved. The question is, can you somehow get your hands on it? Yeah. From a personal perspective, one of the issues here, is when you're going back even to your cost slide, is that the, the, the cost of, of the auto buying that we're, we're in societally, there's a lot of hidden costs. Yes. And there's, there, the unit cost is not, is not at all apparent. That's uh, right. Whether whereas yeah. mass, mass public transportation, you know, you, you argue against the 250, you know, going up to to the B the B zone, whereas as with with transportation, um, so what are the good effects, for example, of uh, Zipcar and Zimride have just Zipcar is the people who rent you the cars short term, and they charge you the full amortized cost of the car. So when you rent something from Zipcar, or from Hertz for that matter, you're you're finding out what it really costs, and so Zipcar and Zimride are collaborating because the people who are obviously the people who are renting zip cars might want to share either the zip car or get a ride from somebody else. And those people are more conscious of the costs. But, but another way to turn it about would be to, to turn it about and say, well, perhaps if, if we have smart, smart objects, smart vehicles, num number one, they ought to tell us how much they cost. Uh, if, if, and if, if we knew how much they cost, we, we could work. And if I were a smart cost. vehicle, I would never tell you. One, smart vehicles could do a lot. In particular, they could solve some other problems. Like, uh, I thought they should do a person miles per gallon calculation. So they could tell you, see, if you put two people in a car, two people in an SUV uses no more gas than a one person in a mid-sized car. If, you, if people were conscious of that, it would make a difference. Yeah, actually, there were cars made in the 90s that had that kind of computation. Because it would take that, it would take your velocity. It, could, it had seat sensors. Yeah. And uh, so that was done. That didn't involve pushing. Well, the, the Garmin GPS, um, as it's calculating your route, will tell if it, it has this uh, eco feature. Um, you can put in <coughs> information about your car and cost of gas, and it will tell you, make an estimate of the cost for that trip. One of my friends suggested to me that yes, this was a good idea, and most important. If you could get your person miles per gallon displayed in the rear of your car on an LED, people who could compete for what, how they were doing in that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you really want to be doing gallons per mile because miles per gallon confuses people. Uh, it gives you the wrong result. Um, you think that by, 
I've done the arithmetic, and it's, it's sort of surprising. If your base car gets 30 miles per gallon, yeah. you and you think, oh, I'll buy a second car that gets more mileage to save money, that second car has to almost be free, at, even at $4 per gallon, because there's really not that much gas to save. Uh, uh, yes. Going from 25 to 50 doesn't save a lot. Of, 25 gallon, miles per gallon to 50 miles per gallon, you know, By the way, over 100,000 miles is a small number, so you can't spend $3,000 on a second vehicle. It has to be you know, $1,500, and that's not even counting the other incidental fixed costs of the second car. That's right. Say, small number, you mean relative to the capital cost of the car? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's a lot of irrationality about this. One of the, these, these companies that are in the business said that uh, usage spiked during the, whatever it was, the, the gas crisis, when gas was 4 or $5 a gallon, but if you actually calculated what the difference was to people, especially counting the price of the car, it's still not that big. So there was there was some behavior change with the recent gas spike, but it in yeah, some in many ways. That's why you want to do gallons per mile instead of miles per gallon. Yeah, because then it's more obvious what it, actually how the price is changing. Yeah. There was a study, by the way, a study, very yeah. elaborate simulation study done in the city of Helsinki, proposing lots of circulating vans with ad hoc patterns. And the, and the crossover point sort of was if you hadn't, in terms of whether it was a good deal or not, on the whole was, if you'd already purchased the car, you might as well drive it. If you hadn't purchased a car yet, then this system was economically good for everybody. Uh, yes? A couple of things that get ignored way too much. Uh, public transit, transit, one thing that it never can do is replace the car trunk. You know, if you're buying things, the car trunk lets you haul them right to your home. Public transit can't do that. You really need to have some kind of little luggage carrier that follows you along on the public transit. That's your keep them secure while you go to the second store, too. It's called, it's called a roller board. I was at a conference one time where the... Yeah. Roller board. Well, you can... Big roller board. This transportation expert was saying that he, he was looking, what was the greatest innovation of the past 20 years in transportation? And he claimed that it was a roller board because it allowed many, many more people to be... Pedestrians, but your thing is the storage feature. You know, you frequently have things stored in your car that are there for you know, your exercise class after work or. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Having a personal car is a great idea. So, in fact, my my marketing. I'm starting a business tomorrow. I first of all, I, I wouldn't even try to to tackle this problem of convincing people to give other people rides. I would try to see whether I could create the world's best taxi and limo dispatching system that did everything up until the point you brought in civilian drivers. Because there's a lot you can do. You can get the taxis and vans to pick up multiple people. You can schedule them. People do various simulations that show you can make them 30% more efficient. So I would do that, and then I would do it in a place where nobody had cars so that uh, so you didn't get into this thing of people being habituated to having their cars. You do it with younger people, like universities, let me see, I've got a couple of the, the company, the most, three most successful companies perhaps are Goose, which works for Genentech and New Ride, and they basically go to companies and say, let us provide you with a complete travel solution, of which ride sharing turns out to be not so, po not, not so important. Uh, Zimride has, I think, just signed a deal with Stanford, and but mostly I think they're providing rides for Stanford students, some, well, I actually talked to them. Mostly they started off in universities providing rides home on the vacations and things. But in fact, I th they said that they were getting a certain amount of attract, um, interest from Stanford staff and faculty who wanted to do it. And I even was offered a ride from somebody um, who lives near me. And naturally, I said, I don't want to ride with somebody I don't know. <laughs> and actually, I am going to ride with this person. I promised myself to do it. It was was sufficiently interesting sounding that I do, you know, do it. Anyway, the places to start is sort of up for grabs. And in fact, I'm told, I get various reports of what goes on in China, but maybe this whole business would fly in China. Certainly, uh, there are many, many more people with, without cars. On the other hand, the big cities have better public transportation. Uh, what else? I guess I've kind of mentioned everything. The most successful company that we were aware of at this conference was New Ride. And the great deal there is they get free, the local retailers, this is 
what you might call location-based advertising in a crude form, local retailers love to give them coupons, which they give to people who get points. The people love building up these points. They don't want the cash. They just want to get these points. And then they go and they buy stuff. And furthermore, the, the coupon givers get good marketing and advertising information. So New Ride is succeeding on that. And they don't charge the people, and they try not to charge the companies, and they sort of get money from municipalities and sometimes companies. Uh, I already said I would recruit taxis and limos first. Uh, there are lots of ways to demonstrate participation. I mean, if you buy a Prius, everybody knows you're green. Uh, if you buy a cell phone that allows you to hitchhike, uh, it's harder to tell. Uh, somebody said that ha having one big location where everybody meets to do this would be a way of advertising it. Uh, so there, there are hundreds of ideas. Uh, for a technical way, back, prove, back, you know, be a, finding an economist or doing the, finding the data to prove the existing of a tipping point, I think, in fact, is a data research problem. Having an all voice interface might be a great idea because it's, for drivers, it's important. I mean, I think someday Google, Trans, Google Maps is going to kill somebody who's looking at it on their phone while they're driving. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then, then you don't have to get into all these businesses of, make, of figuring out how to implement it on the 17 different kinds of cell phones. You just do what 511, you would just plug this thing into 511 and you'd be done. Uh, the previous slide that you had up there, you skipped over quickly. Uh, uh, that depends on the cultural issues of your professional drivers. Uh, the Minnesota, I believe it's Minnesota's having problems with the airport cabbies do not like picking up people in of certain cultures. Because hmm. the, cult, the drivers have a culture and this, they just won't pick up certain people. I mean, they're not Pakistani. Whatever it is. The, uh, I, I paid for a marketing study about the whole transport business and it's, it's actually, well the good news was they said there are lots of dispatching, lots of computer dispatching things get, getting traction with these companies. They're buying them. But the wage structure is very low, and this whole thing of introducing more competition, uh, it it's it's, can be a nasty business, uh, the taxi limo business. Uh, there, there might, somebody told me they thought there must be 1,000 limo companies in the Bay Area, uh, 950 of which consist of one or two limos. Uh, those guys who are struggling, unlike the taxi drivers who kind of have a protected market, the limo drivers might love this thing. So you could just say to a limo driver, hey, go buy an iPhone, or, or go buy an iPhone, I will feed you fares, and then use the voice interface with all the, with all the riders so they don't even need to have an iPhone. And if you could demonstrate that you were increasing their revenues by a certain amount, maybe you could make a business out of this. Um, I'll see if I can show you this one. This is... Uh, anyway, there are, um, so mostly what we have here are lots of ideas what's a, and, and a couple of semi-successful businesses um, the, uh, or businesses which haven't failed yet and maybe they just keep, maybe they'll just keep popping up for the next decade. Um, I, don't, I guess this isn't going to work. Try this one. So I'm just. Uh, hmm? no, it's not going to work. Go to uh, if you go to Deus Ex Machina on YouTube, and ask to see the. Uh, it's a uh, it's a motorcycle which is also an exoskeleton. It's. Uh, it's very cool and, and an alternative to doing all this other stuff, which, which actually, interestingly enough, you know, you look at that really stupid looking car that they were, inter General Motors was introducing, the two person car that had a little crash bar on the top of it. No person would ever get into such a thing. I, only the most unfashionable person well, in the world. Yeah, yeah, it was a se you have to segue. But this, <laughs> but this other thing, which is this Deus Ex Machina thing was done by a, uh, a USC design student and it's, it's uh, t 
totally cool. You just you get into this thing and you uh, just go f soaring down the road. Uh, okay, well, you've actually... Uh, Yeah. Oh, I see what the problem was. It didn't want me. It's probably the anti-downloading squad got me. Uh, okay. Uh, that's essentially my talk. Thank you for your ideas and, and for listening to me. Yeah. You stepped on my applause, Hal. What is that? <laughs> There's another one to add to your checklist of, of ideas to think about, which is there's the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Yeah. Okay, and I don't, I don't know all of the, the fine print, but my description of people who have never heard of it before is roughly that they get to figure out who gets screwed. And it wouldn't surprise me if something similar about like that. I've met a bag or whatever they are. Uh, there are well, there are lots of things. That, so the zoning, the thing that seems to happen around here the most is that when a company like Sun or a university like Stanford wants to build a new building, the person issuing the permit makes them promise something about what they're going to do about traffic or parking. Ironically. Ironically, what they're trying, what they all, what in the past what they're trying to do is force them to put in more parking so that more people can drive. Now, there are lots of people saying what they have to do is convince them to put in less parking so fewer people drive, make it more of a hassle. Uh, but anyway, they, and so Google, by the way, is reducing the parking. But that might be against zoning. It's kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> there are going to be lots, there certainly are likely, especially in the Bay Area, to be lots of organizations. The MTC. Metropolitan Transit Commission, who people who run 511.org, kind of have a charter to do this. Problem is they're not actually aggressive enough. This entrepreneur was complaining about the fact that the that a company can kind of get a pass. He can't sell his product to companies because they're sort of these minimal things like 511 and 511.org that that purport to help the problem. And some companies are doing what they do to to check off the item. Uh, there's a guy named Michael McLean who's got a th thriving business helping companies do their commuter thing. In many cases, it's because it's been mandated by somebody. But certainly, there's a lot of a lot of policy things that could make a big difference if they were put in place. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is that air pollution people have a really big stick when it comes to, to solving problems. Yeah, but yeah right. right. But what they could do is, by the way. There are things called hot lanes they're threatening to put in and charge people money for driving in the HOV lanes by themselves. Uh, and uh, in China, of course, the thing that happened in China was during the Olympics, your, if you had an odd-numbered license plate, you could only drive on odd-numbered days, which gave lots of people real incentives to find at least one carpooling friend. And, and so in, I've forgotten what they're called. They're called pinch pinch car, pinch something in Chinese for ride crowd. And there are websites all over China which you can find that or to put people together. License plate. But strangely <laughs> enough, um, paying people money. And then there's the whole thing about whether you ought to pay the people who are doing the driving and whether the site ought to facilitate that or not. That's another business decision. Some people do it and some people don't. Uh, but if you pay them too if people get paid too much, then the taxi people get upset or the insurance people come after you. And uh, pickup. Licensed people want a higher grade of license. Yeah, right. And the pickup in Toronto, pickup pal got sued by the bus companies uh, for, and, they, and had to obey a whole bunch of rules that, that got in their way. But I think all these laws and regulations and the municipal organizations are, can uh, be very good in this respect. And, and I just talked, there was a guy at this meeting from the Department of Transportation, which allegedly has a $500 billion uh, stimulus package to do something. So, so but yeah, so uh, the problem with ride sharing, frankly, when you talk about $500 billion, is there's no way to spend any money on that much money on it. There's no way to spend enough money on it so that they could even, it's even worth their while to shovel it out the door to you. 
wearable motorcycle hasn't been prototyped yet. It's simply just a concept. It's a concept, yeah. yeah. Okay, I've been looking at it. Here. Yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, lots of, lot, I'm sure a lot of people would buy them. Can you get your kids up at daycare like this? No, it's a, no this is really... Well, see, motors, a, a motorcycle or a motor scooter also gets great mileage per person per gallon. So why... And since this is such a style, since it's such an irrational thing, maybe just convincing everybody that motorcycling is cool is... Uh, and it would also reduce the population. Well, of, I have <laughs> another friend of mine. Oh, uh, <laughs> and and the, the problem with the wearable motorcycle is you can't have the babe sit on the back where the motorcyclist say where she's going to get an orgasm sitting on the bike, as an example. So that's the problem. Oh, There's a lot of people who believe that. <laughs> well, yeah, the other person said you, when you go fast, it sort of tilts you down, so you look like you're, you're going down the thing with your hands face down, and then people wonder about what would hit you in the face. It's pretty, pretty cool, yeah. Um, it's my impression that most of the cities in this country uh, limit market entry for taxi cabs in one way or another. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The uh, New York City taxi medallion uh, system is the one I'm most familiar with, having grown up there, where uh, you know, if you wanted to be a cabbie, the medallion was the uh, big expense item. $120,000 or so. Yeah, it was about uh, $30,000 back in my youth when it's I was there. It's $300 million now. Yeah, back when a car was 3000 so you know, it was about the same ratio. More uh, expensive than a seat on Wall Street. Yeah, well, I was just Googling through the, some of those things a few days ago, and there have been many economic studies of whether you should regulate it or not regulate it. And it definitely has the property that it, it is such a low-margin job for the people actually working in it that even though deregulation, uh, let's say more people say deregulation is good than say that it's bad, but uh, yeah, medallions are a big idea. And then... The, and, and, and actually, in certain places, the mafia is a problem, too. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, strangely enough, in Pittsburgh, there was a limo service who had discovered the wonderful uh, wow factor of having really beautiful women driving the limos. And they were doing a great business. But they got a call from the mafia and said that they, you know, this was encroaching on something which was sort of like their business, and they didn't want them doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, there are, uh, there are lots of issues. But van, by the way, van pools were subsidized in the early 90s. And lots of people loved these van pools. And actually, I would say maybe the way, uh, there's a lot to be said about having roving vans. People mm -hmm. sometimes call them jitneys if they're not legal. Where the, it's just a big taxi cab is all, it's a big taxi cab where everybody understands you can have multiple riders and you're not supposed to complain when the taxi cab stops to pick somebody else up. And I think it would be much cheaper. It could be scheduled with all kinds of clever computer stuff. And it would so seem like, I mean, a bus is too big because it has to stop so many times and it tends to have a fixed schedule. A car with four people in it is kind of small. But the idea is, uh, my theory was, oh, Google or somebody could provide the information system and let the marketplace decide how to service it. And I, I still think Google should do this, but partly because it doesn't, you know, once, you, once you're a multi-billion dollar company, you can't fool around with these crummy little multi-million dollar things. There's currently a lot of gas being wasted on large buses with one or two passengers on them. Right. Diesel, actually. Diesel. <laughs> yes. I've actually heard, uh, I've heard the same thing about trains, commuter trains. If you look at Caltrain, those are very big trains with not many people on them. So... That's, you know, that's another thing. By the way, the train and the bus companies then get after the carpooling people because they're taking away business and making them less efficient. Uh, they did a survey of the casual carpoolers in the East Bay and discovered that if they outlawed casual carpooling, it would actually decrease automobile traffic because the people who were in the HOV lanes by virtue of picking up people would stop driving. Well, as I see it, in this, when I imagine it, it would be a mechanism to get me to Caltrain. Yes. Well, that's what, what I began to think of is you just need to patch together things. You need a very, uh, let's say, a very reliable way of making all these micro contracts to get you from one place to the other and to do it in a much less haphazard way than we currently do it. And you do without having to take your stuff out of one vehicle and carry it over to another vehicle really means the only way you're going to ever do that is with, like, automatic cars. Yes. Well, by the way, the, uh, 
I thought well, I thought one of you were I thought you were about to mention somebody was talking about SkyTrain or something. There's these wonderful plans of having these little electric cars you drive around locally, then you hook them up to something, and they they then they go streaming down the thing, and you get off them all. All those now there's something we can spend five hundred billion dollars on. <laughs> Another model to think about it's is the bicycle model. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in fact, this hitchhiking thing. Sorry, uh, yeah, it gets you home with your stuff. High tech hitchhiking is packet switching, where the people are the packets. You just get out with your cell phone. You have a place you want to go to. Car picks you up, drops oh, you off. Francisco. What? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was thinking another place to look for ideas would be the white bicycle uh, experiment in Amsterdam. Yeah. Well, I know that they. I know uh, it's worked at Livermore too. It's just it's just free bicycles for everybody. Yeah. There's something in France, I think, where you can rent very cheap bicycle rentals. Mm -hmm. There. Uh, yeah, there are many ways to solve this problem. I just, as I say, I just got, I kind of got interested in it of saying, I'm afraid, I confess it was technology driven in the sense of saying, oh, cell phones, internet, what can we do here? It, actually, Stu, Stu Card, that was, you were there at the genesis of that idea, uh, was, uh, this Selker once again was, he was just flaming about how he couldn't get from the San Jose airport to his house in less than a few hours. And it was all a coordination of, I mean, simply coordination of schedules. What you most often hear people say is the, all the transit authorities in the Bay Area don't connect with each other very well. But one little, you know, if you just have a person who happens to be, you know, if all these people belong to the ride-sharing club and they were driving from here to there, you could get these quick little things to Caltrain. In fact, by the way, I mean, all the businesses are running, Genentech runs a constant stream of um, vans between the Caltrain station and their offices. Potential slowly growing market is, is, is sort of dealing with some of the, the negative aspects of aging in place, where we have this suburban model from the 50s and 60s that just isn't going to work for, for, for people getting older. And That's right. So, and some of the solutions are you know, really uh, actually concierge services that, that provide not just transportation, but all many other services. In fact, sort of age in place senior living centers where you, you play a a flat rate and you get your services, one of those of which is transportation. Yeah, well, I actually was asking the Department of Transportation guy, why in the world we have dedicated buses for these people when we can just do it all with taxi vouchers? Or train the taxi drivers to, to provide these extra services, give the older people vouchers, because the place where I live, which is Oak Creek, the older people are always saying they can't even get a taxi to come there. So one of the economic questions I was trying to sort out was, um, could the taxi business bait in the peninsula be made more healthy by this? I just don't, they just don't, the taxis seem to be overpriced and in, in some areas for some time, but now that they seem to have migrated over to a system called outreach that has individual cars that go to individual homes and pick people up and take them where they need to go. Yeah. Minimal fee. I wish you were a Yes, Stu. Um, isn't it the be hard other than sort of regular rights to work to make this work in areas with the low population and that and you can make it work well in the one in one corridor and so on, but uh, you know the, the ride to the train station for somebody who lives out in Los Angeles is you just have low enough density that you have all these long drives. I think I mean I think you're right. Let's say the extreme sprawl makes it a problem. Uh, and you know you would just you would just have to see. I would think if you lived in Palo Alto in the middle of Palo Alto, it wouldn't be so bad. I mean, my over optimistic way of analyzing all of this is to look around and say, how many people are how many people could I hitchhike with right now? People who are driving down the street, uh, and that's often a big number. But yeah, finding uh, well, you could. Something where you regularly go to work at a certain time, and so there's a certain group that develops that people can do that. The regular, strangely enough, and another thing that conflicts with this, by the way, is telecommuting. And lots of, apparently, you know, actually, here was a, I got two interesting factoids out of this workshop I went to last week. One is the highest ratio ethnically in the United States of carpooling people are Hispanics. 
uh, and it happens a lot throughout the southwestern United States. And the good news and the bad news is, is that they're doing that because they don't have a lot of cars to sh among them, and so they share their cars, and as soon as they get a little more wealthy, the first thing they want to do is buy a car. And then maybe they give some other people rides. And I forgot what the other factoid was. Say that last On, on Tuesday, I think there's an interesting dynamic. When people live way up in the, you know, in the Honda and stuff, sometimes they card share more. And so they, there's coordination and there's some camaraderie and we're, we're against the world and I know this person does, you know, and stuff. So I, I think that uh, there's kind of a combination. And it's a sociological thing. You know, how do you build, build it up so people think of, oh my gosh, you know, if I just changed, if I just thought about that, that other person, that's in my neighborhood that kind of does some things like me, maybe, maybe I can coordinate a little bit. Uh, making it, this thing I just got from the guy in the Department of Transportation said, how can we make uh, ride sharing cool? It doesn't look like a cool thing to do now. It's a thing that you do because you have to. That's Ted's uh, major point was Americans, unless there's been a huge change of attitude, Americans want things that enhance their lives. They're not prepared to face the fact that their life is getting less convenient and less pleasant. So whatever it is we're selling them, it's got to be something better. Uh, even, even if in the end they save money. Let me recommend that in a month, um, Bob Metcalf is coming here. Oh, right. And Bob, give a preliminary of what he's going to say, actually at the Computer History Museum, about three weeks ago. And these are things he's going to touch on. Well, right, he's got Right, his theory of this was his how to what to do entrepreneurs conquering the energy. Yeah, he has a particular phrase for uh, uh, trying to basic, basically you want to be able to have an excess of energy, obscene of excessive energy available, but how you're going to get this is <laughs> But the thing is this: it's, he's claiming it's not green. That's yes. the thing. Yeah, right. Well, well, actually, great. I read this great book by George Friedman claiming. Among other people claim that we're going to beam it all down from space with microwaves. I don't want to get, I don't want to get away in the way of one of these microwaves coming down with all this energy. But you can, I just heard it on the radio today. They were saying, you know, more solar energy is accessible from a satellite than is than mankind has used in the history of mankind in terms of electricity. Yeah, there's a serious project being proposed for that actually. Billions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, yeah, but anyway, yes, Met I've heard of good things about Metcalf's thing. Uh, mostly, he said entrepreneur. The other thing is, of course, uh, the other upsetting thing I've heard is that the clean energy is the next bubble. What we actually need is another bubble. Forget about solving all these problems, and it might as well be clean technology. <laughs> I mean, our country runs on bubbles now, so it's the bubble economy, and the clean energy will, uh, clean tech will be better than the last one. So. <laughs> Yes, Hal. So, in terms of local transportation, I have a data point. Um, I occasionally take the Caltrain back from the airport. Oh, so, 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 you know, you get off at the airport and you, you know, get out to the car. Oh, and you get out bar, take part of the Caltrain and you discover that you've just missed the, the train that you want. <laughs> And then you, you know, go check the, the board and you discover that the next train that goes through is an express and doesn't stop. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.